All right, for those that want it, here is a proof of the product rule and a proof of the quotient rule. Um, I'm just going to go through each one step by step. Um, start with the product rule. The product rule says that if there is a function p of x, and I'm just calling it p for product, where p of x is the product of f of x and g of x, then the derivative of p of x is equal to the derivative of f of x times g of x plus f of x times the derivative of g of x. And I talked about that in the previous video uh, with an example of how to use that. So let's talk about proving that. I already know the definition of the derivative of f of x. It's the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Uh, that's what they called first principles. And I can say the same thing about g. g prime is written the same way with g's in place of the x. So I'm just kind of stating that so that we remember the definition of what a derivative is. All right. So I'm going to apply the same definition to my product function p so that p prime is the limit as h approaches 0 of p of x plus h minus p of x all over h. And I'm going to write p in terms of f and g. Since p is f times g, then p of x plus h is f of x plus h times g of x plus h. And p of x is f of x times g of x. So I just made a substitution based on the rule that I stated in the previous slide. And now here's the trick to the whole proof. What I've done in the middle in red here is I've added and subtracted exactly the same thing. Okay, I wouldn't expect you to come up with this, but um, so I'm, I wouldn't ask you to prove the product rule, but I just want you to understand what I'm doing here uh, because it is going to serve my purposes. Remember, I'm going to have two terms in my answer. I'm going to have f prime times g, and I'm going to have g prime times f, and I want to allow that to happen. So what I've done is I've subtracted f of x times g of x plus h, and I've added it back again. And you'll see why I've done that in a, in a couple of steps. Okay. So what I can do now is I can separate this fraction that has four terms on top into two separate fractions, each of which have two terms on the top. All right, so I just put the first two terms in this first fraction and the last two terms in this last fraction. And so that's what I've done. Let me copy this onto the next slide just so that I can keep working and explain as I go. Okay, so there it is, exactly the same thing again. And what I notice is I have a common factor in each pair here. Um, in this fraction here, I've got g of x plus h showing up in each term in the numerator. So that's a common factor here. And I've got f of x showing up in both terms here, making it a common factor of both terms in the numerator here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out the common factors. All right. Now when I do that with g of x plus h, I have to keep it as part of the limit because there's h's in there. So I'm going to keep it as part of the limit. But with f of x being a common factor over here, there are no h's in here, so it really doesn't matter what happens to f of x as h approaches 0. The h approaching 0 has no effect on f of x. So I can just pull it out front and then look at this. Well, this is my definition of what f prime of x is. And this is g of x plus h, but as h is approaching 0, that h is going to go away, and I'm going to be left with g of x. f of x stays f of x. That's kind of nice. And then in these square brackets over here, I have the definition of what g prime of x would be. Okay, So that's how I get the answer that I'm supposed to get. So that is a very quick proof of the product rule. Worked out kind of nice. I'm going to do kind of the same thing when I do a proof of the quotient rule. And here it is again. It says that if q, and I'm using q for quotient, if q of x is the quotient of two functions, f of x and g of x, then the derivative of q of x is the derivative of f times g minus f times the derivative of g all over g squared. Okay, I kind of said that in the previous video, but I didn't say why it is. Well, here's why. 
Okay. Just like before, I'm going to define what f prime of x is and what g prime of x is based on first principles. Those uh, definitions are probably pretty familiar to you by now. And so, based on that same first principle, uh, this is how I can write q prime of x. It's the limit as q of x plus h, sorry, it's the limit as h approaches 0 of q of x plus h minus q of x all over h. Okay. And if I replace q with what it's equal to, then q of x plus h is equal to f of x plus h over g of x plus h, and q of x is equal to f of x over g of x. Okay. And that's all still over h. Um, I've mentioned before I don't really like fractions within fractions, so I'm going to make this division by h into multiplication by 1 over h. So there it is right there. It hasn't gone away. And then I'm going to focus my attention on finding a common denominator for these two fractions that are still in the numerator here. All right, so if I do that, then I do what's called smiling. That's kind of a shortcut that some people learned. Um, I multiply these two together, f of x plus h times g of x. I keep the minus. I multiply these two together, f of x times g of x plus h. And I put that all over the product of the denominators, g of x plus h times g of x. And that looks like a big smile, which is why they're called they call it smiling. So that's what I just said. Okay. That's how I find the common denominator and get the new numerators for each fraction. 1 over h is still there. Uh, it was division by h, but now it's multiplication by 1 over h. So that's what I have. And now I'm going to do a trick similar to what I did in the product rule. I'm going to add and subtract the same thing in the numerator. So it doesn't change the value of it, but it does get me to where I need to go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract f of x times g of x, and then I'm going to add it back later. All right. So everything else is the same. I've just subtracted this and added it later. Let me copy that on the next slide so that you can still see it. All right. And now I'm going to take, just like before, I'm going to take this limit and I'm going to split it into two separate limits. Okay. 1 over h is in both of them. I haven't gotten rid of that. The denominator is the same for both of them, but I'm going to take these two terms and put them here, and I'm going to take these two terms and put them here. Now, notice that there's a minus here. The reason there's a minus here is because I actually factored out a negative. Okay, and that means that this term will become positive inside the brackets, and this term will become negative inside the brackets. So that hopefully that's not too much of a jump. All right, so you can kind of see there was a minus there. So factoring it out makes it that positive and that negative. All right, well, now I'm looking at these two uh, limits separately. And if I look at this one, I notice that there is a common factor of g of x in both. And here, there is a common factor of f of x in both terms in the numerator. All right, so if I factor out the g of x, I'm going to leave it outside of the brackets because it has nothing to do with h. So as h approaches 0, it's going to have no effect on g of x. And the same thing with f of x in this second pair of terms. As h approaches 0, it's going to have no effect on f of x. So I'll just put it outside here. All right. So what I've done is I've kind of switched the denominators here and moving from this step to this step. h has gone back over here to the second fraction, and this product of g's has gone as the denominator of the first fraction. And I've done that in both cases. I kind of know where I want to go, so that's why I'm doing this. Um, so switching the denominators shouldn't really change anything. All right, and so this is what I end up with. Let me copy that on the next slide. So there it is, same thing again. All right, and so let's look at what's happening as uh, h goes to 0. Well, as h goes to 0, this goes away. And so I've got g of x times g of x. So that is 1 over g of x squared. Okay. And then on top here, that is my um, definition of f prime of x. And this is just g of x. So I've got f prime of x times g of x all over g of x squared. 
minus, there's f of x. I'm just going to copy it. Okay, this is my g of x squared again, because as h goes to 0, g of x plus h is going to look like just g of x. So that's g of x times g of x, which is g of x squared. And then over here, there's my definition of g prime of x. So I've got f prime of x times g of x, all over g of x squared, minus f of x times g prime of x, all over g of x squared. So I'm going to make that look like that. And since the denominators are the same, right, I can move these numerators so that they're over the denominators and it looks nicer. The denominators are the same, so I can actually subtract those terms in the numerator and use the common denominator. And that's the result I was hoping for. Okay. The derivative is f prime of x times g of x minus f of x times g prime of x all over g of x squared. So that proof was a little trickier, but I hope you follow all the steps. Um, if there's any step or process that was tricky, please let me know, and we can talk about that uh, in class or in tutorials or whenever.